Let me uh, open us in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for today and this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We recognize, Father, that today is unique. There won't be a day like it after this, and there hasn't been any days like it before it. And we know that in your book of life, our very days are preordained. And so I just pray that today in this unique time that we have, that we would press into your purpose as we seek to go, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ um, this particular last uh, Sunday in September. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, if you could locate uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And verse 10. Um, so the last time I was with you, because um, it got interrupted by a couple of things. Uh, last week was a congregational meeting. But the last time I was with you, we had completed the study on the rapture, which we did in uh, 62 lessons. So we've talked about what is the rapture, when is the rapture, looking at other verses, strengthening the pre-tribulational case. We've gone through the opposing views, and then we've looked at one second after the rapture. So now we're at a part of the study where we're trying to ask and answer questions that people have submitted on the subject of the rapture. And I had asked people um, in the church, publicly and online, to send in their questions. And my goodness, boy, did they. There are so many questions. We're going to have to divide up this uh, part of the study into several parts, I'm, I'm thinking. But here are the first 10 questions um, that came in. And so let's go through these um, today. Um, the first question relates to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And online, under the rapture teachings, you're, you can find a PDF of the full question that was submitted. And then there's some notes under each for bullet points in the answer I'm going to try to give. So here we go. Question number one relates to the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. The question is, in your understanding, does 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 refer to the tribulation or his eternal wrath of hell? So take a look, if you could, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. Um, just a general reminder, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to the second coming and or the rapture. So obviously it's a subject on Paul's mind. And this is how Paul ends uh, his first chapter to the Thessalonians. He says, to wait for his son from heaven. Are you waiting for that, by the way? That's what we're to be doing. We're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Thank God for that, or Jesus wouldn't be the real deal. Whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus. And then it says, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So people that don't believe in a rapture or they don't believe in a coming tribulation period, they, they basically interpret that as, well, that's just a promise, you know, that... I can trust Christ and die and go to heaven and I won't have to go to hell. So they, they make uh, the wrath to come sort of um, a generic reference to hell. It has nothing to do with the coming tribulation period. Um, my answer to that is I think this is speaking of the coming tribulation period because the Bible talks about wrath that's happening currently. 
Um, you have to understand something, that when the unbeliever dies, they immediately go under the wrath of God. And it's sort of a spooky thought to contemplate, but you see a reference to it in Luke 16, verse 23, uh, the rich man that died and went to Hades. And immediately after death, it says, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Um, there's another reference to immediate wrath that's happening now over in the book of Jude, verses 6 and 7. Where it says, and the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the day of judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, uh, since they, in the same way as these, indulged gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So those in Sodom and Gomorrah that died in unbelief, the, the verbs there are present tense. They're currently undergoing wrath. So with that being said, going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul here is making reference to wrath that is to come. So I don't think that, that Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 is just making a generic reference to hell. I mean, hell is an ongoing reality, but he's speaking about something more specific that's going to come to planet Earth one day. And I think Paul is speaking of here the tribulation period. When Jesus will open a seven-sealed scroll in heaven, and that will bring God's wrath to the earth via the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the golden bowl of wrath judgments. And that then becomes a argument for the pre-tribulational rapture position because we cannot be here when these judgments are unfolded. Because of passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, which speak of the wrath to come. So the wrath to come is not just a generic reference to hell. That's an ongoing reality. It's a reference to the specific wrath that is going to be poured out on this world for seven years. And if we are that generation on the earth that experiences where the earth will experience that, then the promise of 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 is we are exempted from that time period. And this would fit very well with the context because, as I mentioned before, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to the rapture or the second coming. So what is on Paul's mind is not just giving a generic description of hell, but he's talking about something more specific. If you follow me over to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 and 3. So you see what I'm doing here. I'm answering a problem passage with the context of the whole book. He talks very clearly about the tribulation period. He says in chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Uh, that's how the unbelieving world is going to be caught off guard by the tribulation. It's going to catch them like a thief in the night. Uh, this is not speaking of the rapture here. The rapture is a positive thing. When a thief breaks into your house in the middle of the night, that's a negative thing, right? Just it, the, the parallel is the flood. I mean, just before the flood, they were just... They apparently had ignored Noah's warning of 120 years of warning, and they were eating, drinking, marrying, and given in marriage, and Jesus in the Olivet Discourse basically says they were like that until the very day that Noah stepped foot on the ark. So in the same way, 
Paul is not just dealing with generic descriptions of hell. He's talking about a specific time period of wrath that's going to be poured out on planet Earth. Down in verse 3, it says, While they are saying, Homeland Security, whoops, doesn't say that, sorry. While they are saying, Peace and safety, I like to say, Peace and Homeland Security, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with a child and they will not escape. The Greek there, there's a double negative. And when it talks about they will not escape, a double negative is like saying they're not going to get out of it. Uh, it's, it's the strongest negation you can give in, a, in Greek, two negatives together. You know, no way are they going to get out of it. Uh, Spanish translation, no way Jose are they getting out of it. So it's like a woman who's pregnant, and when it's time to deliver, it's time to deliver. Uh, it's not a time to get into a discussion you know, with your wife about this or that. It's like she's got to get to the hospital pronto. And that's, in essence, what uh, the tribulation period is like. And this is what Paul is dealing with. If you go to verse 9, <clears throat> you see the context continuing. And it says, for God has not destined us to wrath. There's our word again. But for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously here, Paul is not just dealing with hell. He's dealing with a specific dimension of wrath, the seven-year tribulation. And slip over to 2 Thessalonians for just a minute, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And you have to understand that the Thessalonian letters were written back to back. There's not a lot of time in between those letters. They were both written probably within six months of each other. Paul is in Corinth and he's, ask, he's answering questions the Thessalonians are asking him about the end times. So whatever he's talking about in 2 Thessalonians, that's a pretty good bet that that subject is on his mind in 1 Thessalonians. And in 2 Thessalonians, very clearly, he's talking about the tribulation period. And look at verses 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, that son of destruction. And then it says in verse 4, Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. There he's clearly talking about the tribulation, because he's identifying the event that's going to happen right in the middle of the tribulation period. And then if you go down to verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians 2, actually verses 8 and 9, he says, Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That's a reference to an event at the end of the tribulation. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders, and then if you jump down to verse 11, it says, For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that, they will not believe, so that they will believe what is false. So it's talking about a time period where the Antichrist is present, desecrating the temple, performing signs and wonders in the temple. Or at least the statue that's set up in his honor. Revelation 13, verse 15, is, seems like it's performing signs and wonders in the, in the temple itself. And it's a time period where God is sending upon the earth a deluding influence. So with all of that context in mind, you see very clearly, going all the way back to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, where it talks about Jesus is coming to rescue us from the wrath to come. It's not just a statement about, gosh, trust in Christ so you won't go to hell. It's a statement that the wrath he's speaking of is a tribulation, contextually. 
And so that becomes a promise that we won't be here for that. Amen? So that's actually one of our pre-trib arguments. So I hope that helps. This takes us to question number two. And for this, we've got to go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. And this has to do with the idea that a day is a thousand years. So if a day is a thousand years and God created the world in six days, we've got 6,000 historical years for the earth. And then there's going to be another thousand years for the millennial kingdom. So there's a lot of people that hold to this idea that human history can only last for 7,000 years. Because to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. So 6,000 years of human history, 2,000 from us back to Jesus, another 2,000 from Jesus back to Abraham, and another 2,000 from uh, Abraham back to Adam. So that makes 6,000, and then we have 1,000 years left for the millennial kingdom before God dissolves everything and uh, gives us the new heavens and new earth. This was really big in 1993. I remember when I was a young Christian in 1993, everybody was telling me this is the rapture year. Why did they say that? Well, because 2000 uh, minus uh, 1993 is seven. So we're coming up on this seven year increment. So there's only seven years left for this 6,000 year time period to elapse in all of human history. And we've only got another thousand years for the millennium. So there's an awful lot of people running around teaching this and thinking this. And they get this from 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Which says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And then you take a thousand years equals a day, Second Peter 3.8, and you combine it with God's creation of the world in six days and you've got your 6,000 years. And then we've got a thousand years for the millennial kingdom. So what would be my answer to that? My answer to that is they're combining two verses that don't go together. I mean, to make this whole thing work, you've got to take the creation days, Genesis 1, actually the whole seven days, God resting on the seventh day, goes from Genesis 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 3. And then you've got to run over all the way to 2 Peter 3, verse 8, and get the idea that a day is a thousand years, and then you figure, well, if a day is a thousand years and God created the world in six days, there's got to be 6,000 years of human history prior to the millennial kingdom. So why is this an illegitimate way of reading the Bible? Well, because you're combining two things that don't go together. You're, you're dragging in to 2 Peter 3 a bunch of stuff that 2 Peter 3 is not talking about. And that's pretty much how you can recognize false doctrine is they're not following literal interpretation. You say, what is literal interpretation? If you were to w- look at the word literal in the Oxford Dictionary, which is one of the most academic dictionaries that's been around for a long time. You look up the word literal and it will say by the letters. In other words, by the letters means you're interpreting what's there in the passage rather than what's not there. So if I were just to have 2 Peter 3, I would never conclude that there's 7,000 or 6,000 years of human history, because Peter is not addressing the creation days at all. In fact, you won't even see the seven days 
six days of creation, one day of rest cycle in 2 Peter chapter 3. So what is Peter saying? Peter, when he says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the day with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He's quoting the oldest psalm in the Psalter. 150 psalms, right? What's the, and this is going to make you guys look really smart today because that psalm is going to come up in the sermon. And I'm going to ask the congregation, what's the oldest psalm in the sermon? And you're going to say, 90, Psalm 90. And everybody's going to look at you like, oh my goodness, you must be apostolic. (laughs) Psalm 90 is the oldest psalm in the sermon, and it's the only psalm written by Moses. The majority of those psalms written by David and others. But Moses actually wrote a psalm. And in Psalm 90, we can look at that just for a second if you want, you can see what Moses says. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday. It passes by, or as a watch in the night. So when Peter says, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, he's quoting Psalm 90 verse 4. And he is explaining why it's taking God so long to get the show on the road. Because the last days are going to be marked by false teachers who are going to come forward. And basically what they're going to say is there's not going to be a second coming. Because everything continues as it was from the beginning. I don't see any evidence of God's intervention in history. In fact, Carl Sagan himself, I saw it when I was in public school, right? So it must be true. He talked about billions and billions and billions and billions of years. So all this hype about the second coming, there's not going to be a second coming. Everything just continues on as it was from the beginning. And Peter says, when people begin to argue this way, it escapes their notice that with the, Lord, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. God is outside of time. So to God, it doesn't seem like there's been a big holdup in the events. To us, it seems that way, but it doesn't seem that way to God. Because to God, tomorrow is already today. Because God is, is not bound by time. Um, it's, it's like going and watching the Rose Parade in Pasadena, California. And you could be one of those crazies, and I was one of them one year. Who, And I had to do it when I was younger, because I don't think I could do it today because I need my beauty sleep. Amen. But you basically stay up all night and you get this really good seat on Colorado Boulevard. And you watch the Rose Parade pass by and you can see, and they spend, it's amazing how much time they spend preparing these floats. It's unbelievable. You can see one float after another coming by. Well, then at some point in your life, you wise up and you say, why should I stay up all night to see this? I could just watch it on television. (laughs) And when you watch it on television, what they give you a lot of times is the aerial shot from the helicopter. Where you can almost see the beginning of the parade and you can see the end of the parade. So the aerial shot of the parade is God's point of view. Sitting on Colorado Boulevard is man's point of view. So when the false teachers come in the last days and they say, oh, there's not going to be a second coming, the answer to that is you're analyzing it from man's finite, time-bound perspective on Colorado Boulevard. To you, it looks like there's a big holdup, but it doesn't look that way to God. Because God, quoting Psalm 90 verse 4, is outside of time. That's the only point that Peter is making here. It has nothing to do with 
figure out how much human history has elapsed and how much is left to go by dragging the creation days into the discussion. You follow? So the interpretation that I gave you on this is literal. It's by the letters. I'm not dragging in a bunch of stuff that's not there to make it work. But the 6,000 days of history viewpoint, they don't do that. They've got to connect two passages that don't, that don't go together. And they've got to make uh, uh, Peter say something that he doesn't want to say. So, you know, whatever your view on concerning the age of the earth, I've given you mine last week. You don't go to 2 Peter 3 to make the case. And then you don't figure out, well, gosh, the millennium is going to take a thousand years. And so we're coming up on 7,000 minus the millennium. And so the rapture has got to happen fast. That's what people do. And that's just insanity. It's just really bad Bible exegesis or interpretation. So hopefully that helps. Question number three, don't, don't leave 2 Peter, because we got another question from 2 Peter 3. Look at what verse 12 says, because it says something there that we can actually hasten the day of the Lord. Look at 2 Peter 3, look at verse 12. Looking for, that's what we're supposed to be doing, Looking for, now look at this next word, and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. People say, well, pastor, do you believe in global warming? Yes, I do. It's just at the end when God burns everything. Pastor, do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? Yes, I do. It's just, it's at the end. Carl Sagan didn't tell me the truth when I was in school. He put it at the beginning. But it's, it's a revelation of the end time events. And then it gives the impression that little old me and little old you can do something to speed it up. So what could little old me and what could little old you do to speed up the process. In other words, if you're impatient and you want to get the show on the road, there's something you can do to quicken it or hasten it. Um, there is the participle hastening, um, spudantis, where we get the word speed. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So we can actually do something to speed the whole thing up. What could little old me and what could little old you do to speed the whole thing up? There's the answer right there in verse 9. Verse 9 is the explanation why God postpones everything. Doesn't cancel it, he postpones it. Look at verse 9. It relates to the nature of God. And it says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Repentance there means change your mind, which is a synonym for faith. Change your mind about Jesus. The reason God holds the whole show up is there are people out there that have not had the opportunity to do that yet. So God in his um, infinite wisdom postponed the events of the second coming until 1983. Because looking down through the corridors of time, he could see 1983, which was the year that I became a Christian. I heard the gospel and I believed it. So God held up the whole show just for me, 1983. And it's the same with you. God, through the corridors of time, could see the point in time in which you would trust Christ as Savior and he held up everything just for you. And God apparently is doing that for other people. So if you want the events to happen faster, then get the gospel out. 
spread the gospel. Evangelize. Because the more the gospel goes out, the more evangelism takes place, the more that opportunity is given to people, the more they have that opportunity to accept or reject the message. And as that happens, the character of God, which is long-suffering, is satisfied, and the end times can happen even faster. So 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise. In other words, everything in prophecy is going to happen. The problem is the timing. The Lord is not slow about his promise. Now, why would the Lord not be slow about his promise? Why is he not always looking at his watch like we are? He doesn't have a watch. (laughs) He doesn't need a watch. You only need a watch if you're time-bound as a finite human being. God is not time-bound, verse 8. The Lord is not, so to God, it's not slow at all. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. There must be some other people out there that have to be given the opportunity. So he holds it up. Now, I would connect this with a cross-reference in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26 where Paul capsulizes this principle for the church age. Paul writes in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed about this mystery. So it's a new truth that's going to be revealed here. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. The most important word in that is partial. Israel is currently in a state of unbelief, but it's partial. A partial hardening has happened to Israel. Now look at this next word, verse 25, until. That's a huge, that's very important. So Israel is held in a state of temporary blindness until a condition is met. Until what? Look at this. Here's us. Until the full number of who? Gentiles has come in. That's me. That's you. Because the primary people in the age of the church that get saved are Gentiles. Periodically a Jew gets saved and it's wonderful. But what's normative in the present age is the number of people that are getting saved are Gentiles. And apparently, God has a number in mind. Now, you you ask me, well, pastor, what's that number? How am I supposed to know? doesn't say. I don't need to know. God knows what it is. And God knows at a specific point in time, the body of Christ will be complete because the very last Gentile will have come to faith in Christ. What does it say in verse 26? And so all Israel will be saved. In other words, the partial hardening that's happened to Israel is going to be removed in the end time events of the tribulation and beyond. Israel will come to faith in the tribulation, but that is not going to happen until God's purposes in the current age have elapsed. And his purposes in the current age is to reach a specific number of Gentiles with the gospel that only he knows. And once that number is reached, whatever it is, the church is made complete, The bride is made complete. There is no more an earthly purpose for the church on the earth. And so the church is translated into heaven. And God then begins his unfinished work with uh, national Israel. So if you want God to begin his unfinished work with national Israel, do everything within your power to get the gospel out to as many people as is possible. Because that is what will, connecting it with 2 Peter 3 verse 12, 
uh, speed up the day of the Lord. This, by the way, if you understand this, helps us explain why personal evangelism is so difficult. Why is it so difficult for us to evangelize? Why, why is it that when the Holy Spirit prompts you to share your faith with somebody, you get every negative input into your brain that you could possibly get, into, get, get meshed into your brain? Oh, they're going to think I'm a kook. Oh, they're going to think I'm crazy. What if they ask me a question I can't answer? You know, I'm not a professional. Why don't they get a professional to do the job? I mean, why is there so much warfare related to personal evangelism? Here's another question. Why is it so hard to find a church that's clear on the gospel? I mean, why do you have to search heaven and earth and search all over the internet to find a church that just says you're saved through faith alone? I mean, what's so, you know, <laughs> we're not dealing with rocket science here. Um, why, why is it so difficult? It has to do with the angelic conflict, is what it has to do with. Satan is always attacking the clarity of the gospel. He's always putting things into your brain that you're not qualified to share your faith. Because Satan knows what, that as more people get saved, we get closer to the full number of Gentiles coming in. As we get closer to the full number of Gentiles coming in, then his days are numbered. You see that? And he likes ruling the world. He's done it ever since Genesis 3. He does not want to forfeit his terrain. And he knows the end times events of God are going to put him under God's thumb, finally, in the abyss for a thousand years, and then he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. And Satan has read the book, and Satan believes it. So in his sick, twisted, darkened mind, he thinks he can hold it, hold it off as long as possible. And if God has set certain conditions related to the full number of Gentiles coming in, then that's what he's against. Let's corrupt the gospel. Let's confuse personal evangelism. Because maybe that full number won't be reached. And if that full number is not reached, then I continue on and on, Satan says, um, ruling the world. So that's what 2 Peter 3 verse 12 is speaking of when it says hastening the day of the Lord. Question number four relates to the two witnesses. You might jump over to Revelation 11 verses 3 through 13. You get there two witnesses. And this has to do with the fact that are these two witnesses, when are they going to be born? Are they going to be born and grow up in the world before the rapture? Assuming they come to faith before the rapture, as they're being reared in this world. And if they come to faith before the rapture, why wouldn't they be taken in the rapture is the question. And if they're taken in the rapture, how do they have a ministry in the tribulation after the rapture has already occurred? So the full question is, are the two witnesses born and raised on earth again? Or do they just reappear on the earth after the rapture of the church? If they are born and raised, why are they not raptured? Wouldn't they qualify? Now, assuming that they're born and live a natural life and come to faith before the rapture, presumably they'd be taken in the rapture. But the truth of the matter is, the only thing we're told in Revelation 11 is that these two guys just show up. You know, we're not told how they come on the scene. It's just there they are in events uh, in, the, in the midpoint related to the ministry of these two witnesses. Now, in our Revelation series that we did here at this church, you can go back and listen to our teachings on this. Um, I'm of the persuasion that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. 
I give all the reasons for it in our Revelation series, but some of the things, some of the things that caused me to move that way is that as you study Revelation 11, 3 through 13, you'll find their calling cards are given. One of them turns water to blood. Hey, we got a guy in the Old Testament that did that, right? His name was Moses. Did it with the Nile. Another one shuts up the heavens so that it cannot rain, not for three and a half days, <laughs> not for three and a half months, but exactly for three and a half years, 1,260 days. That's exactly what Elijah did in the Old Testament. You'll see references to that in Luke 4, verse 25, I think it is. And James chapter 5, verse 17. And Moses and Elijah, it's kind of interesting that they never had a chance to complete their ministry. Moses, you remember, struck the rock. And the consequence of that was he could only view Canaan from a distance. And then he died and was buried. So he never got a chance. Think about it, leading Israel for 40 years, but you can't enter. He never got the chance to complete what God started in him. Um, Elijah, we know from the books of First and Second Kings, was taken to heaven in a chariot, was it? And so he, he, he never died. So it, to me, it's completely and totally logical that these two guys would be allowed to supernaturally come back to the earth without going through the process of being born into the world and reared in the, into the world, they're supernaturally dropped into the tribulation period to complete their task, which is to bring the nation of Israel to, uh, to repentance. There's a very strange verse about Michael arguing with Moses in the book of Jude. Excuse me, Mar Michael arguing with Satan, excuse me. Michael arguing with Satan, and what are they arguing about? They're arguing about the body of Moses. That's a strange thing to dispute. I mean, do you go around disputing people about that? You know, Let's get in an argument about where the body of Moses is. Why would Satan care about the body of Moses? I think Satan understands that Moses is going to come back. And so he's doing something with the body, trying to come against God's plan and program. Not a lot of details are given. Um, Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6 tells us that Elijah is coming back. In fact, devout Hebrews have a chair set out for him at the dinner table. You know that, right? It's called Elijah's chair. So they apparently think he's coming back too. Um, when Jesus transfigured himself in Matthew 17 and verse 3 he revealed himself in his glorified state who was right there with him Moses and Elijah so Moses and Elijah have a tendency to make guest appearances when the kingdom is eminent the kingdom was being offered to Israel at that time so you put all of this together and I think uh, Moses and Elijah are not going to be born into our world as babies and grow up and come to faith. I think some way, somehow, in the providence of God, they're going to be supernaturally dropped into the events of the tribulation period to complete their mission, is my thoughts on it. So Moses and Elijah will not be part of the body of Christ. Their ministry will take place supernaturally after the body of Christ has been translated to heaven. So that's the best I can do with number four. Question number five relates to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the tribulation period. And it says this. Why in the tribulation period would the Holy Spirit not enter those who become saved? 
In the Old Testament, he would come upon believers for certain tasks, but in the tribulation period, would not some of those saved need the enduring, permanent indwelling of the Spirit to navigate the beast system if they're going to remain alive to inhabit the kingdom? So one of the things that we brought up is the fact that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament had a completely and totally different ministry than he has today. The Holy Spirit was present. The Holy Spirit has been active ever since Genesis 1 verse 2 and 3 where the Spirit was moving on the waters in creation. So the Holy Spirit is all over the Old Testament, but his activity was more limited than what it is today. You see that very clearly in 1 Samuel 16, verses 13 and 14. This is a thousand years before the birth of Christ and later before the day of Pentecost when the church started. It says, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, that would be David, and the spirit of the Lord came, watch this now, upon, not in, see that? Upon David from that day forward, and then look at verse 14, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So what was normative of the Spirit of God in most of the Old Testament age is the Spirit of God selectively came upon certain people to fulfill a task. In this case, David, it was needed in his life because he was about to become the second king of the United Kingdom. Saul was the first king of the United Kingdom, and the spirit was taken from him. So Saul is governing the nation from 1 Samuel 16 all the way to Saul's suicide at the end of the 1 Samuel book without the anointing of God, because that's how the spirit worked. He could come upon And he could leave. Compare that to what Jesus said in the upper room. Jesus in the upper room signaled some new rules are about to be in place concerning the spirit. And he said to his disciples just prior to his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the birthday of the church in Acts 2. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that will be with you. How long? Forever. Well, gosh, that's, that's not what we read about a thousand years earlier, where the Spirit left Saul. Jesus says, new rules, because they're all worried there in the upper room that he's leaving. And he said, don't push the panic button, because when I leave, the Spirit of God is going to come And he's not going to be in a situation where he can depart. He will be with you forever. By the way, if you think you can lose your salvation, that would contradict what Jesus says there in verse 16, right? That is the spirit of truth. It's very clear he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not know him, but you know him. See, a lot of people take Christ's statements here as he introduced the Holy Spirit for the first time. They all sat around saying, Holy Spirit? We haven't heard of there's a Holy Spirit. No, no. They all knew about the Holy Spirit. But they knew him through his limited operations. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Gosh, that's not what 1 Samuel 16 verse 13 says, when it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. So what happened in Acts 2 was a dramatic shift of the work of the Holy Spirit 
from the middle column in red to the blue column. The Spirit, beginning in Acts 2, was no longer coming upon people, but in people who trusted Christ for salvation. He was no longer coming upon selected people, but everybody that trusted Christ for salvation. And once he came not just upon, but in, he's inside of you forever. That, by the way, is the whole basis of the moral appeal by Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse, uh, what is it, verse 9 or verse 19, one of the two, where they were involved in sin, and he says to them, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you understand the new rules that are now in place? And when you commit a sin, you're dragging the Spirit of God into that sin because Jesus in the upper room said the Spirit would be in you forever. I mean, it's, a, it's an entirely different way of looking at morality and ethics and holy living in the body of Christ. And almost no preacher uses this. The way they hammer the sheep is they tell them over and over again, you're not going to heaven. Or you lost your salvation. Or you never were a Christian to begin with. You'll discover that Paul in Corinthians is not doing that at all. He's using the new rules of the Holy Spirit as an incentive to get them to live holy. So on the day of Pentecost, we had a dramatic shift from red to blue. And in the tribulation period, what I believe will happen is we're going to shift one minute after the rapture or one second after the rapture from the blue back to the red. And the Holy Spirit will be very active, but he will go back to his more limited role. Why would I think something crazy like that? Because of the 70 weeks prophecy where Israel was given a stopwatch in Daniel 9 with 490 years on it. That whole stopwatch pertains to a period of 70 times 7, 490 years on the stopwatch. And that stopwatch has nothing to do with Sugarland Bible Church or First Baptist of Houston or any other church age group. It says 70 weeks have been decreed, given to Daniel, for your people and your city. Now who is Daniel's people and Daniel's city? Israel and Jerusalem. And as we have tried to study this very carefully, we have observed that 483 years of that stopwatch have elapsed. In other words, when the Jews in Nehemiah 2 began to rebuild the temple, when Nehemiah was given permission by Artaxerxes to leave Susa in Persia and travel west for 350 miles roughly and go back home and start to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem, the moment that decree is issued, God put his finger on the start button and exactly 483 years elapsed to the, mo to the moment of Palm Sunday when, when Jesus presented his messianic credentials to the nation. And the nation said, thanks but no thanks. The moment that happened, God said, pause. So according to my old math... 483 minus 490 leaves how many years remaining? Now, oh, come on, you guys. See, I'm, we're a homeschooling family. And so we're getting into math and algebra, and I'm trying to help my daughter with it, and I can't believe how much I've forgotten. Because when I studied it, it was back in the dark ages when the earth's crust was cooling. 
and we were walking to school in the snow, in bare foot, uphill both ways, fighting Indians the whole time, you know. <laughs> so basic math, 483 minus 490 leaves seven. So what is happening in the interim while God's hand is on the pause button? A fresh work of the spirit called the church age. But there's seven years left on the clock, right? So how is the Holy Spirit going to work in the seven years left on the clock during the tribulation period after the church has been translated to heaven? He's going to go back to the exact same rules he was following in the first 483 years. Because whatever your belief about the first 483 years has to be your belief about the final seven years because the final seven years are part of the original clock as well. They just haven't elapsed yet. And by the way, and let me just throw this in, the church wasn't around for the first 483 years. Did you know that? So how in the world could the church be around for the final seven years? I mean, you start putting those pieces together, you become very pre-tribulational you know, in your perspective. The Holy Spirit clearly is active. I mean, he's doing stuff. Um, over in Revelation 7, verse 3, he's sealing the 144,000. But that's going back to the Spirit coming upon people selectively for a task. So that's what is going to make living for Christ in that time period so difficult. Because you're living for Christ in that time period when there's a lot of exigencies and emergencies for the people of God. But you're living for Christ in a time period where the Holy Spirit's role is scaled back to what it was doing initially. So I hope that helps a little bit. One more question. Why is Israel the focus of the tribulation? So the question is, the tribulation period always seems to be focused on Israel. Christians are removed, so there remains unbelieving Gentiles and unbelieving Jews. There are about 15 million Jews worldwide and billions of Gentile unbelievers. So why are the Gentiles not given such a minor role? In rapture teaching number 60, I believe that you said the spotlight goes back to Israel. So why is Israel the focus again in the final seven years? Very simply put, because Israel was the focus in the first 483 years. You follow? Because Israel, this is very important to understand, and this is what makes teaching like this different than what you'll hear from most denominations. Israel is the gift that keeps on giving. Most people are taught that God is through with Israel. They accomplish their purpose. Our response is they accomplished a lot of their purpose but they haven't accomplished everything yet. All the way back in Genesis 12, verse 3, as God was forming the nation of Israel, he says, in you, Israel, the families of the earth will be blessed. That is how God has chosen to work. He has chosen to bless planet earth through Israel. Uh, verses that we don't have time to look at that teach the same truth. You can jot down Isaiah 42, verse 6, and chapter 49, verse 6. And it is true that God has blessed the world through the Jew. Not the least of which is this book, all written by Jews. Jesus came into this world as a Jew or as a Hebrew. But the truth of the matter is when you start looking at everything God said he would do through Israel, he's not finished with them yet. Mainline denominations say God is finished with Israel, but who cares what they say? What does God say? There, there is no possible way to take the Old Testament promises and manipulate them 
to get them to say that God is through with Israel. That's why people that teach this doctrine, God is through with Israel, replacement theology, are always trashing literal interpretation. Why are they trashing literal interpretation? They always trash it because literal interpretation doesn't support their theology. That's why. If you take God at his word, it's obvious that everything he promised to do in the Abrahamic covenant has never been fulfilled. And that's why the great evangelists of the tribulation period will be 144,000 Jews coming from the 12 tribes. And Israel will become again the preeminent servant of God. Where if you want to know anything about God and you want to learn to walk with God as a Gentile, it's, that knowledge is going to come to you through Israel. But no big surprise because that's how it was working in the Old Testament, wasn't it? What did um, Naomi, excuse me, Ruth... The Moabitess say to her mother-in-law, Ruth, you know where Moab is, right? It's on the east of the Jordan. What did, what did she say? She said, Ruth 2, verse 16, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. In other words, she, Ruth understood, let me see, I'm getting my characters mixed up. Yeah, Ruth understood that she had to learn of God through Naomi. And so she became a proselyte. Um, so that's why in the final seven years of human history, the final seven years on the clock with the church in heaven, God is working again through the Jews. The 144,000. He is prophesying through the two Jewish witnesses who I think are Moses and Elijah, Revelation 11. Satan doesn't like it. So he is attacking Revelation 12. The woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. When you connect that with Joseph's dream, Genesis 37 verses 9 and 10, it's a clear reference to the nation of Israel. Now, God is going to use the Gentiles during this time period to help the Jews because they are the ones that are going to be thrown in prison. They're going to need cups of water. And that's how the Gentiles during this seven-year time period are going to manifest the fact that they too are believers. James says, faith without works is what? Is dead. And at the sheep and the goat judgment, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, the Gentiles demonstrate their faith by whether they helped Christ's brethren, who happen to be the Jews that are going to be hunted down and persecuted during the tribulation period. Brethren can refer to the Jews, Romans 9. Verse 3, so don't think that the Gentiles are uninvolved, but you're going back to a situation where the preeminent servants of God are not going to be our missionary societies. By the way, praise God for missionary societies. But just a little, I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble. God doesn't need our missionary societies. Did you know that? He uses them. But whatever the church leaves incomplete is going to be fixed through these believing Jews who will move into center stage. The spotlight will go back upon them. And that's why there's such a Jewish uh, focus in the final seven years of the tribulation period. Well, look at that. I thought we were going to get through 10 today. We're just getting warmed up. So those of you that want to submit questions, you can do it at awoods at slbc.org. Please send them to that address so we don't overrun our church, our beleaguered church staff. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for question and answers. Help us to use this time to gain greater clarity into your word. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said... Happy intermission.